Geography and topography and climatology of the topic. Um, I'm going to skip forward now. So that's been, these features have been true throughout the, the sort of natural history and human history in Africa. But I'm going to jump forward now to uh, the to the modern era. And for our purposes, the modern era is going to be begin to be the birth of this Atlantic world that I described. The rediscovery of Africa by Europeans who uh, become obsessed with exploring Africa because of something extraordinary that happens. Uh, uh, there is, in the early 14th century, a ruler of a kingdom uh, in the present day country called Ma. Uh, uh, there was a kingdom back then which also was called Ma. And there was a ruler of this kingdom which had not so long earlier in its history become Islamicized. And so the rulers of this Malian kingdom begin to um, travel across the Sahara Desert and to, uh, uh, to carry out their duties as Muslims, which is to visit Mecca, uh, to make a pilgrimage to Mecca during their lifetime. So in the early 1400s, uh, <laughs> the ruler of Mali crosses the Sahara Desert in an incredible convoy uh, laden with um, Camels uh, filled with bags of gold. Uh, this ruler's name is Mansa Musa. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. M A N S A Mansa. Second name Musa M U S A. Um, it, a lot of modern research has concluded that this man is the wealthiest person to ever live. Mansa Musa is the ruler of the Malian Empire, which sits. Uh, uh, in the Sahel, but sort of between the two major re rivers of the Sahel, and at the headwaters of the uh, of the gold trade that comes out of coastal Africa, a couple of places uh, in near in and around present-day Senegal, which is on the western edge of Africa, and uh, from present-day Ghana, which is on the sort of underbelly of West Africa, uh, in the Gulf of Guinea on the Atlantic Ocean coast. Uh, that's the, the second place, Ghana, is the biggest source of gold in Africa in, in the era we're talking about. Anyway, Mansa Musa's empire sits between the west coast of Africa and Europe, uh, and on the edge of the Sahara. So any trade between West Africa and Europe has to pass through the Sahel, has to pass through Mansa Musa's empire. Mansa Musa uh, monopolizes his trade and the Malian Empire becomes incredibly rich. He goes to Mecca with so much gold that the price of gold was distressed on the world market for 10 years. Uh, that's how much gold he lavished uh, in gifts and gestures during his visit to, to Mecca. So in, in Europe, Europe having been in, in a kind of religious war with uh, Islam uh, already for some time, the Europeans get wind of this and the Europeans say, begin to spread stories about um, fables about the origins of this world begin to spread, about Africa being so rich that there are plants, that gold grows on plants, that there are plants that are just, you know, flourishing with gold. And they become determined to find the source of this gold. This becomes the spur to maritime exploration in Western Europe in the uh, subsequent, in the century after Mansa Musa, which ultimately lead, leads to the quote-unquote discovery of, the, of, the, of the, the new world, it was called by the Spaniards. Uh, and uh, just a little bit later, of uh, European uh, exploration of and conquest of uh, much of Asia. The original source of this European thrust outward into the world was, how do we find the African world? And so the, the Portuguese first and the Spaniards begin sailing down the coast of Africa to the point where they get to what is now called Ghana. And they discover in the rivers, coastal rivers of this place that we now call Ghana, there is plentiful alluvial gold, meaning that gold that can be found in the river beds. That if you just pan in the river beds, 
we can get a lot of gold. Uh, in the space of just a few years, this becomes the, the, the most important source of gold in the European economy, and a source of incredible wealth, uh, for new wealth for Europe, which then funds the fleets that become the fleets of Columbus, and the fleets of Magellan, and the fleets of many other of the famous Spanish and Portuguese conquistadors who then go around the world, essentially uh, uh, conquering and colonizing many different places, both in the Western Hemisphere and in the Eastern Hemisphere. Again, the emphasis I'm trying to make is that uh, they were looking for African gold, which is not how this history is typically told. Uh, when they reach West Africa, when they reach what is now called Ghana, they begin this trading, and they understand from the Ghanaians that the Ghanaian, Ghana had a very powerful kingdom at the time, uh, for many centuries after what called, Ash called Ashanti. When they reach the coast of Ghana, they understand that the Ghanaians are aware that they have a lot of gold, but they don't make as much, they know that gold is a valuable thing that symbol is about, but they're not quite as obsessed with it as the Europeans are. What the Ghanaian, uh, uh, the Ashanti kingdom is most uh, uh, obsessed with is the thing we've been talking so much about, population. Here's a kingdom trying to form it's a pre-modern state kind of status. It's trying to form a state it's, it has imperial ambitions of its own within the sub-region of conquering and assimilating and absorbing neighboring peoples. And the biggest challenge from the perspective of, of an African king in the environment that we've spoken about is population. I need more people, especially I need more men. I need people to fight for me, and I need people to farm the land. Um, and so the, the, Gane, the, the Ashanti, begin to trade with the Portuguese. The Portuguese understand this. The Portuguese need something to give them to get gold. And the Portuguese say, well, we'll ca go capture slaves in other places and bring them to you and trade with you. We'll give you slaves. You, the Africans, we'll bring you African slaves. And you give us your gold. And this becomes the basis of the flourishing trade between the Portuguese and the Shogunate and later other Europeans and the Ashanti in Africa. And this model we take off. This is the kernel that spurs what will subsequently be a huge explosion of slavery. It becomes uh, an, an immense source of wealth for, um, uh, for Europe in the subsequent centuries, and an absolute catastrophe for Africa. Africa is a continent whose long-term historic challenge, singular challenge, has been how to build, a, sustain some kind of momentum population so that cities and states can form. How do you accumulate enough people? Africa becomes caught up initially in seeking this kind of intra-African slavery, but subsequently, by example of the success of the wealth that the Europeans are able to generate and trade slaves, an export of people, an export of slaves into what is, the Europeans call the New World, and this is the origin of people of African descent all throughout the New World. They were all brought as, uh, uh, you know, as a result of this kind of trade uh, with Europe, which then begins in a really catastrophic way to depopulate Africa. So it's been estimated that uh, of the nine million slaves who were shipped across the Atlantic between the years 1700 and 1850, and mind you, I'll get into this in a little finer detail in a second. This represents only, this is the sort of high water mark point period of the slave trade. The slave trade begins, as we've said, uh, in the 15th century, but it really becomes intense in the 18th century. And then, you know, it reaches its peak in the mid 19th century, and then suddenly it, it, it's more or less suppressed by the end of the American Civil War, by a little bit before that, the British Anti Slavery Act, etc. So during this high water bar, uh, nine million slaves are shipped across the Atlantic uh, uh, in, in this way, an incredible mark. Uh, uh, but that number conceals the true importance of the phenomenon we're talking about. Um, uh, if it is true that nine million slaves were, were landed on American shores in bondage, uh, and when I say American, I mean all of the Americans. Um, uh, you have to also try to determine. So that means nine million survivors. That means nine million people actually made it across the Atlantic. That means 
not the amount of people who were captured and imprisoned and then sold, uh, uh, stockaded and then sold and then put on the ships. That means the people who actually made it across the Atlantic healthy enough to be able to be sold in slave markets in the New World. That 9 million figure is only the number of people who survived this experience. The number of people who did not survive, but who were caught up in this phenomena, is estimated nowadays at about 12 million, which means that 12 million people died in, the, in, in having been captured uh, or in the process of being captured for slavery, uh, but never having survived the Atlantic crossing. Altogether, of course, it's been 21 million people. What does 21 million people amount to destiny or continent in my house? Doesn't perhaps sound to you like a terribly big number, but as I work through the demographic realities of Africa, I think you'll get a better appreciation of just what a hit this represents. Um, uh, Africa, because of the slave trade, had zero net population. Sub-Saharan Africa had zero net population between 1700 and so these 21 million people were taken away had the result in part of making population growth flat for 150 years uh, in African history. These were not just any 150 years. This is the 150 years of a time when Europe is really gaining a kind of moment in terms of its own will to dominate other people, such so as control the destinies of, of, of essentially the entire world. Um, and the weakening of Africa by virtue of this drainage of people, of course, prevent, prevented the formation of states. And uh, you know, here and there, uh, you had important states, Ashanti, which I mentioned, which had diplomatic service, it had mail service, it had uh, uh, weights and measures, it had customs, it had many of the attributes that we would think of as modern states, but it never reached uh, record with. with, with level of recognition by the European powers and was devastated as it got caught up with, as many other parts of Africa were, it got caught up in the slave, slave experience. Um, so um, slavery, the siphoning out of all the people um, uh, is doing two things simultaneously, generating enormous wealth for the European traders, as in North America, so it's for plantation owners in, in plantation societies, etc. And at the same time, it's crippling Africa. In, in, in a way that's hard to overstate. Um, uh, the total number of slaves that are exported who actually land in the Americas between, 15, uh, between the year 1500 and the late 1800s is estimated at 18 million, which means that if you run the same rough ratio that we talked about, so 9 million during that narrower time frame, with 12 million who didn't survive, that's, that, you know, uh, one and a third more people died than survived. So to do that math for the 18 million, I have not done the math, but so one and a third, so that's what? That's 24 million, that's uh, 36, that's 42 million Africans who were taken, uh, if, if this ratio is roughly correct, for, for the entire 15, uh, three, uh, from 1500 to late 1800s, that's 42 million Africans who were siphoned off of, uh, of sub-Saharan Africa and caught up into this, slave phenomenon. Um, uh, demographers have tried to, modern demographers have tried to estimate the net impact on African population. So 42 million people siphoned off over a period of centuries. Um, and they have concluded that Sub-Saharan Africa would have had perhaps 100 million people by eight, the year 1850. Uh, in fact, with the slave trade by 1850, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, that is the portion of Africa beneath the Saharan Desert, only had 50 million people total for all of Sub-Saharan Africa, for all of West Central and Southern Africa, vast amount of states, 50 million people. Um, the cost of the slave trade has to be understood in other terms. It's not simply as important as demography is, as much as I've sought to stress it. It's important in lasting social political terms as well. Uh, slavery left the mark on societies that remains in place today uh, by creating winners and losers. The kingdoms that became the favorite suppliers of Europeans. Europeans didn't come in system, of course, about slavery, but the most typical pattern did not involve European conquest. It involved European trade 
with local interlocutors, the, the then typically strong local kingdoms, who then go lord it over neighboring societies and you know, defeat them in combat and kidnap or take prisoner uh, their able bodied people. Um, this process of creating local winners and losers uh, created uh, an enormous amount of ethnic division in Africa, which persists today, which we can talk a lot about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, lasting memories about uh, different groups in terms of their relationship to each other as on the basis of, of uh, this kind of trade of slavery. Uh, and it also created a kind of a broad phenomenon that's been studied really, really interesting to social science, just, just not quite recently. In terms of the legacy of, of, of social trust, social trust is a good that has an enormous amount of economic impact. In societies where people trust each other, you're able to make contracts, you're able to form and enter into business relationships uh, that are lasting and that are, are much more profitable than, than societies where social trust is, is low or in the system. Uh, and the phenomenon of slavery, people you know, hunting other people down, constant state of warfare between local societies in Africa to supply slaves to this Atlantic trade has cre created an enormous amount of legacy of, social, of low social trust that persists today. There's a fantastic study by uh, an economist at Harvard named Nathan Nunn, N-U-N-N, who has shown a, a, a stark correlation between the geographic areas where the West African slave trade was heaviest and high instances and high incidence of low social trust. Uh, and the correlation is, 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 is extraordinary. Uh, I'm trying to go very fast here. Um, uh, so the, the basic finding is that the places where uh, uh, the Europeans bought or uh, obtained the largest number of slaves um, in the per capita sense, are the places that today in West Africa are on, also on per capita basis the poorest. Uh, and no one is claiming that this is a direct one to one causal relationship. But this is a new notion is helping social science understand some of the persistent causes of challenges to development of economic growth in the African environment. Um, so um, the Africa that we see on the map, which I've referred to, Africa that has 54 countries, 54 countries that look like almost sometimes as if they were created by a cookie cutter. Um, uh, where, where did, where did, how did this come about? So we see the interest in Europe, in, by Europe in Africa, that comes from Mansa Musa, the exploration that takes place, the discovery of the gold trade. Uh, then Europe sort of becomes preoccupied with other things. Uh, it, it, um, colonizes, of course, the New World very intensively. It uh, begins to colonize Asia quite intensively. For Africa, for a, a good stretch of two, three centuries, the major interest in uh, by Europeans in Africa just simply becomes the slave trade. The Afri Europeans are not really interested in Africa for many other reasons. They're busy buying and selling slaves off the coast of West and Central Africa during this period, but that's, that counts for the bulk of the relationship. Something then begins to happen in the 19th century. Uh, you know, the world up until that point, from the perspective of Europe, Europeans have been divided into the Islamic world and the Christian Christendom and Islam. And they were mortal enemies and there were wars back and forth over the ages. And you know, the Muslims uh, had uh, at one point uh, controlled much of Southern Europe. Uh, the Turks later on uh, and, uh, of course, uh, controlled much of Central Europe, and uh, at one point even seemed as if they were going to begin to conquer uh, part of Western Europe. Uh, then the Turkish Empire collapses in the 19th century. Uh, it, is, it, it comes apart, uh, and Central Europe then becomes divided among the Western European countries in terms of zones of influence. Uh, and the European states, which had a common enemy with Islam, suddenly don't have a common enemy. They begin to cast their attention outside of Europe uh, for other places to compete. There's fierce interstate competition between European states 
then comes to focus itself in the late 19th century, a very short period of time in Africa. Between 1890 and 1895, the Europeans become suddenly seized with this notion of having to control territory in Africa. What determines who will be a great European state depends on how much territory we can get in Africa. And this period in history, this phenomenon, is, is known under the moniker the scramble for Africa. And the great, a single great event of the scramble for Africa is the con conflict that took place in Berlin in 1895, where I believe it's seven of the European powers of the day convene and literally decide with no African representation at all. Literally decide, okay, so rather than killing each other endlessly to own, see who gets the bigger piece of Africa, let's have a conference and, and pull out a map and just carve it up. And so the Europeans in Berlin in 1895 carve up, literally carve up the continent of Africa in a conference uh, and attribute different pieces of the continent to different uh, European powers, to the seven European powers. Um, uh, so, um, and, and the claims that, that were argued, you know, there's a lot of debating taking place around these tables, and claims are made on the basis of, you know, uh, in preceding years, Europeans uh, had, had people like Stanley, uh, Henry Morton Stanley, a name that we familiar to some of you. But each European power had its own uh, uh, famous uh, explorer. These were figures of great romance within European culture. You know, dashing characters who were going out, expanding the realm of their countries to get territory and to discover things like the source of the Nile River, things like that in Africa, um, what they were really doing is uh, signing agreements with local chiefs in all across the continent. Basically getting the local chiefs who were almost always unable to read the agreements to sign away their right to uh, their territory, to say, yes, I belong to the British Empire, or I sign my allegiance to the French Empire, or to the Portuguese Empire, or et cetera, or what have you. Um, and so around this table, the Europeans sit and they say, yeah, well, I've got all these claims. We sign up these people, and you sign up those people. And through a long conversation, they begin to divide the continent. And a lot of horse trade begin to divide the continent up into what become states that we see on the map today. This is done, uh, in, I mean, it's a really stunning moment in history. A country like Belgium, which in fact was a very recent creation in European history and one of the smallest countries in Europe, Belgium, as a result of this, Belgium, the king of Belgium decides, so we're gonna, if we're gonna be a serious country, we're a new country, Belgium. We really need to have an empire. And so the king of Belgium put all of his attention into trying to get a piece of what he called, literally, this was his phrase, the African king. And so he was very clever, Berlin Pontus, much more obsessed with this perhaps than some of the other, uh, uh, the other royalty present to, win a piece of Africa, and win a piece he did. Uh, what is called Congo, uh, is that kind of to now it is the Democratic Republic, uh, second largest country in Africa, becomes Belgian property. Uh, the Congo alone is 70 times larger than Belgium. Uh, the Congo is bigger than France, England, Germany, Spain, and Italy combined. So the king of Belgium, this brand new country, gets control of the Congo. Um, the Europeans set about consolidating their hold on all this new territory. It's an immense amount of you know, digestion that has to take place. And this means identifying products that can be extracted that will make colonization pay for itself. And it means appointing local elites through which Europeans can exercise authority. Um, I'm going to take these things one by one because they're so important. Economic activities vary from place to place. Mining is the big thing in southern Africa. Cotton is the big thing in the arid region of the Sahel that we've spoken about. It's just south of the Sahara Desert uh, because cotton does, can grow in arid areas. Cocoa and later coffee become the big things in West Africa. Rubber becomes the big crop in Central Africa, Congo. Um, and the typical um, uh, European regime or regime involved uh, uh, using forcing Africans to work. In other words, forced labor to plant these crops. Uh, uh, and the use of uh, uh, corporal punishment, uh, sometimes including the chopping off of hands of Africans if they don't meet the quota, 
for production for a given for a given crop. The Belgians were the most notorious for that. Um, these kinds of conditions persisted into the early decades of the 20th century. Um, eventually, European nations needed Africa, Africans to to fight in their imperial wars. Africans begin to be recruited forcibly again to fight in World War One uh, uh, for the first time, and then on a much larger scale in World War Two. And we'll ask you, like each of you, the next time you see a movie or a documentary about the history of these wars, just to sort of pose the question to yourself: Have you ever seen the image of an African soldier fighting these wars? Well, Africans were enlisted forcibly in the combat of both of these European world wars on a large scale. Um, and this is something that has never really give, been given any particular attention in uh, popular cultural or recognition of history. Um, I want to talk, talk about tribe when I said Africa is the name for the Afri, this group uh, in Tunisia. Uh, much is heard of the word tribe and tribalism bandied about superficially as the cause of Africa's ills. Um, but most of what people say in terms of this word tribe is said with very little awareness of the origins of, of the phenomenon we're speaking, history of tribal as such, uh, as it is lived on the Early in the imperial experience, Europeans set about destroying African politics wherever they encountered them. We talked about the Ashanti world, very powerful kingdom, very centralized rule. A pretty capable bureaucracy, a formidable army. It took you know, a long time to defeat the, the, the Ashanti early in the uh, uh, very early 19th century. Um, uh, it took the English a long time to defeat the Zulu in South Africa. Uh, this was a brutal war that the English had to fight. So, uh, wherever the English encountered a strong political culture locally, not just the British, the Europeans encountered a strong political culture locally, they set about destroying it. They did not want to have Africans having a sense of autonomy or memories or traditions of self-rule or capacity to defy uh, foreign authority. Their point was to establish their own authority. So they targeted local African politics in order to counter them for destruction. And they did so typically with really with tremendous violence. Um, uh, so Ashanti, I've mentioned, there was a very important Muslim federation led by a person in Samori, centered around Guinea and Mali, which we've spoken about earlier, which was Zulu in South Africa. There were many of them. We don't have time to go into detail. Once these uh, kinds of entities had been crushed and habits of self-rule had been destroyed, uh, kings usually sent into exile. People, the king, the king of Ashanti was sent to the Seychelles, where he died in exile. Other kings were sent to very other places or simply murdered just to get them out of the picture to, to disempower the local populations. Um, the, the Europeans needed, they, they discovered they needed loyal local servants who could carry out their administrative policies and assist in things like police work and taxation. It destroyed the local structures, but you know, it takes. You need some kind of mechanism through which you can govern. And the Europeans were not invested in sending a lot of Europeans to govern Africa. So, so a massive effort was then launched to canvas the entire African landscape and to begin to identify and nominate local actors who could serve these roles. Uh, and this went hand in hand with a rather new kind of science, a newish science called anthropology. If we think of objective things, there's a school of anthropology, of course. Where you are, and where I am, and you know, nobody, most outsiders don't think of anthropology in a sense. But anthropology was very much enlisted in empire. How do we classify these non European peoples? How do we figure out their weaknesses and their strengths? How do we understand their secrets? And ultimately, how do we dominate? Um, and so, one of the things that the Europeans were particularly um, keen to do is to categorize all of the different Africans that they. They encountered. And so they begin to attribute names to societies uh, which become the names that we think of as tribes. And you're going to ask, well, do you mean there was no tribes in Africa before? Um, there were language groups in Africa, in England in Africa, of course, there's many, many, many different societies in Africa, and I'm going to give you a number in a little while. But 
by administrative fiat, the Europeans begin to uh, to lend. So the European through administrative powers begin to reify those kinds of these these various identities that they've gone very busily about talking about category, categorizing, cataloging. Um, reifying means choosing winners and losers, it means deciding who is fit for this or that function. Uh, and this early European anthropology begins to attribute all kinds of characteristics to individual African groups. Some groups are supposedly more intelligent than others. Some groups are su supposedly more apt for military service than others. Some groups uh, so are more supposedly more docile and more cooperative than others, as if these were innate characteristics of the local ethnic group. And so the Europeans then begin through a variety of administrative processes to reify these things and to reward and punish and to otherwise orient various groups in different directions on the basis of their own uh, anthropological understanding of the realities of the terrain. This is the source of the thing we call tribe today in Africa. I don't have time to go very much further into this, but I would suggest if you're interested that you read the work of uh, a, an anthropologist named Mahmoud Mamdani. It's M-A-H-M-O-O-D is the first name. Second name, M-A-M-D-A-N-I. I would also commend to you, this was in the recommended review for my lecture. Uh, Mamdani is not inaccessible in terms of his reading, but he is an anthropologist. And, uh, but there's a very generalist type author who writes about this. Uh, and he, uh, suggested in the recommended readings, a man named Martin Meredith, who I'm going to quote for other purposes in a moment. But he gets into this in a very accessible way. This is not a, a controversial, controversial thing that I've just told you. The tribe is invented by the humans given an administrative life and reified through the process of colonization for the purpose of Europe in order to control and to, to govern this vast territory with very, very, fairly little means at their disposal of their own types of European administrators. They needed people who they could have cooperated with them through which they could get things done. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to give you one example of this in the So one of the biggest tribes, Nigeria famously consists of three very large tribes, the Hausa, the Yoruba, and the Igbo, I-G-B-O. Uh, the Yoruba are, because Nigeria is so large, the Yoruba is one of the largest so-called tribes in Africa. Uh, Nigeria is probably maybe 160 million people, uh, 140, nobody's really sure, but it's a very large country. Uh, the Yoruba are, you know, maybe 20% of the population. This makes it one of the, supposedly one of the largest tribes in Africa. But the Euro, nothing existed called Yoruba had existed. There was a federation of peoples who had very loose associations and had roughly mutually intelligible dialects in southwestern Nigeria, and a guy named Lord Luger comes along, who's the British colonial administrator. And the people who are working for him going about doing the thing that I described, cataloging people and giving and giving them, assigning them attributes. And this becomes the invention of the Yoruba. And Yoruba, this thing that even most Yoruba take for granted today. As, yeah, I'm a Yoruba, of course. We have Yoruba in Nigeria, 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 Nigeria. Even the Yoruba is a totally new invention. 
a century old, which is not speaking. Um, so, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, so I had mentioned uh, 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 Martin Merrick, so that gives me a good start. So, uh, in, in this book of his, uh, uh, which is called uh, The Fortunes of Africa, um, Martin Meredith writes, by the time the scramble for Africa was over, you, you remember, retain that name, the scramble for Africa, Berlin Conference. By the time the scramble for Africa was over, some 10,000 African polities had been amalgamated into 40 European colonies and protectorates. The boundaries of the new states, drawn up by the negotiators in Europe using maps that were largely inaccurate, took little account of the existing mosaic of monarchies, of chiefdoms, and acephalous societies on the ground. Acephalous societies means societies that don't assign chiefs or kings. That's what they have a great, of society, a great number of societies like that. So where Europeans and current societies didn't have chiefs, they said, you got to have a chief, and we're going to call you such and such a tribe, and now you have chiefs. Because they needed a chief in order to administer that, that part of what is the country. Um, nearly half of the new frontiers that the Europeans assigned via early conference carving up the continent were geometric lines. That means typically straight lines uh, that just cut straight across broad swaths of territory as the Europeans horse trade about like, oh, who will get this or who will get that. Almost no attention but paid in these discussions to this, the political or socio-political realities of the in other words. Nobody stopped to ask, hey, are we dividing up group X, Y, or Z by drawing this line this way? Or, hey, are we putting together in the same basket two groups that have famously been at each other's throats for centuries? The Europeans were not concerned with the local African thought processes. They simply drew their lines, and you'll see the lines in the next figure in Africa map. They are straight lines for them. Um, the most important thing to understand about the colonial experience, so there's two really important things to One of them is how short, how brief it was, and the other, one must understand is how cheap it was. In other words, how cheaply it was run, how little Europe invested in the colonization of Africa. By the late 1930s, French West Africa comprised eight territories with a population of 15 million people, and it was administered by only 385 people from France. A population spread across, and again, I'm repeat this for emphasis, spread across what are now eight countries. 15 million people is administered by 385 people. Now, you might ask yourself, what if there was, you know, there's a myth that exists in Western society called uh, the white man's birth, and that this was a civilizing mission. West Westerners were doing this because they were imbued with a sense of duty to uplift the African out of the darkness of the supposed uh, lack of uh, culture and civilization. Uh, I don't credit that myth at all, but even if you wish to even give some credit to that myth, ask yourself then, you must ask yourself, what could 385 people possibly do with 15 million people spread across the vast territories in our countries? Um, British controlled Nigeria, the biggest single British colony. Britain had a bunch of colonies. Nigeria has always been the most populous area in Africa. Um, uh, British controlled Nigeria, a population 20 million people in 1940 was run by fewer than 400 British civil servants. Um, Frederick Cooper, in his book Africa in the World, writes The preemptive nature of the scramble for Africa helps explain one of the main paradoxes of the first half century of colonization. Why did European powers, whose technological dominance over African societies was so clear, and whose racial and cultural arrogance so intense? do so little to develop the regions they conquered. European colonization neither systematically remade Africa nor systematically exploited its population. Africans working for wages, however miserable, remained a tiny percentage of the population until after World War II. Little capital was invested except in mining zones, in certain areas of white settlement, and in port or capital cities. The economics of colonialism were, above all, the economics of fragmentation, 
meaning islands of wage labor or forced labor surrounded by a vast area whose non-integration in marketed production facilitated the recruitment of cheap labor. So now, by now we're talking about, we're up to 1940, the end of the 1930s century. And the picture that's just been painted for you by these two historians, Meredith and, and Turner, uh, is a little Cooper, not Turner, but little enclaves of European contact and wage economy life through rudimentary industries that were owned by Europe and vast surrounding areas where the bulk of the African population lived, where Europe had made almost no art in terms of the life of these people, either economically or otherwise. And otherwise, peace would have come through the moment. This is not me saying this for the rhetorical effect. Um, this is, again, by the end of the 1930s. So the imperial moment begins at the turn of the 20th century. The Berlin Conference is 1895. The Europeans don't begin to actually behave like colonists. They're carving up and beginning to crudely administer. The colonies don't really get off the ground until the turn of the century. Now we're by 1930s, right? Late 1930s. There's the picture I've just described. Um, African independence is going to begin in 1957. So you get to see this other important feature that I've described for you, which is that not only did Europe run their colony on cheap, but the experience of colonization itself was incredibly brief. Having been as destructive as it was, first the slavery, then the, uh, the creation of tribe and arbitrary division of the continent along, you know, uh, this map-making exercise in, in the drawing room in Berlin, Suddenly, having done all of that, uh, the experience was, was, was over almost as soon as it was done. Um, for a variety of reasons, the effect of World War I becomes the catalyst for the end of colonialism. Suddenly placing African independence, or sorry, World War II, with suddenly placing African independence on the agenda. Part of this was due to the experience of African troops fighting for the colonizing masters in, in that war, World War II and coming home and having sacrificed alongside white people fought just as valiantly as white people and having seen, uh, in some cases, being sent to other parts of the world where imperial rule changed, like Burma and other places in Asia, having seen uh, that there were local liberation and that there were local liberation movements in these other countries saying, hey, we want to be equal, we want to be liberated too. And so the African soldiers come back from World War II and become an agent of social and social political change, saying that we didn't follow them for having made such a sacrifice. To give you an idea of the scale of the talking, 374,000 Africans fought for the British side alone in World War II. Uh, the French had African fighting. Uh, and others had Africans fighting on their behalf as well. I don't have those other figures at my fingertips, but for the British side, 374,000 Africans fought in World War II. I would warrant that none of you has ever seen a movie that shows anything about that. Um, so uh, the other thing that happens that causes the sudden end of World War II is the United States. Franklin Roosevelt begins to negotiate uh, the contours of the world toward the conclusion of World War II, and he makes clear to the British that we didn't fight a war to preserve your empire. But, and we are not going to work. Of course, Roosevelt dies before the war ended, but these conversations which really become a major determinant of American policy for European imperialism that told the structure of the, the world geopolitically in the subsequent decades begins under Roosevelt. He makes very clear to the European you know, one of the prices of having us that saved you is that you're going to have to dissolve your empires. So uh, very quickly, India becomes independent and very soon after this. I'm wrapping up very soon after Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. We have some time for questions. The Africans then very quickly on the heels of that also begin to demand independence. Ghana becomes the first country that, that becomes independent in 1957, which is the year I was born. Um, so the Africans fighting World War II, the main agent of this demand in the United States is pushing also. Um, the, um, the Europeans, for, for their part, had never, with the exception of Britain, which had in the last 10 years prior to the end of World War II, begun to have a conversation about the end of the period. But the other Europeans had never previously contemplated African independence. 
there had never been any serious talk in any of the other colonial powers of granting independence to Africa. And in some cases, cases like Belgium and Portugal, there had actually been this you know, series of uh, historical documents about planners and politicians saying that, assuming that they would control Africa for centuries, that Africa would be theirs for centuries. Suddenly, at the end of the 50s, it all comes to a head close in a headlong rush. In the space of 10 years, almost all of African countries were um, In the Congo, uh, the top, uh, so what was the balance sheet of this colonial experience? I said it was done on the chief. I gave you the numbers of the administrators. Now I'm going to tell you from the African side of the experience, what was the balance sheet? What was the impact? This was a civilizing history. The white man's burden. In the Congo, the top ranks of the civil service at, uh, at independence in 1960, uh, there were only three Congolese out of 1,400 officers in the top rank of the Congolese civil service. And two of those people had just been appointed. So in 1960, you only had one veteran civil servant who was out of 1,400 civil servants running the country, meaning country becomes independent with no experience even in civil service. A, a, a vast country, a very big country, a very important country. Um, by 1960, the sum total of university graduates in the Congo, meaning for all time, was 30. There had been 30 university graduates in the history of the Congo, second largest country in Africa. In that year, the year 1960, only 136 students completed secondary school, meaning that the Belgians who had colonized the Congo had created almost no opportunity for secondary school for Congolese people. 136 graduates of secondary school in the year 1960, the year of African independence. Um, more broadly in Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe had left behind a population that was only 16% richer in 1960. 16% of Africans had attained literacy as a result of European colonization in 1960. And out of 200 million people, that's the population of Sub-Saharan Africa, only 8,000 secondary school graduates. Meaning, you get that again, 200 million people across all of these Sub-Saharan African colonies, there were only 8,000 secondary school graduates. In total, not that year, in total, ever, um, and nearly half of those came from two countries, Ghana and Nigeria, meaning that the other that 4,000 of them were spread across the vast number of African countries. So, so I brought you to African independence, and I'm not going to carry on much longer except to say, including the mark, that the period of independence was not much more generous to Africa. The African continent was sub subject to the Cold War, like the rest of the world was. Um, and divided into a kind of checkerboard experience geopolitically, where you had a nominal kind of independence, um, and you had patrons uh, and clients. And the patrons were either France and Britain, in the most direct instance, but hovering over them in the United States, which had a, had a real predominant role in all of the major international institutions and reserved the right to intervene in many places and did in Africa in this Cold War competition. And on the other side of the ledger, the Soviet Union. Um, you will hear from uh, your, some of the subsequent speakers that you'll um, encounter this weekend. Uh, a lot of talk I'm going to assume about Western aid to Africa. And I want to caution you. Um, their talk about Western aid to Africa should be regarded with a very sharp sense of skepticism. I did a little bit of homework, I didn't get far enough in this today, but there is a book called Seasons of Rain by Stefan Ellis, uh, who is uh, a, based, uh, a European based scholar who has uh, a very long and distinguished career in writing the history of uh, economic development uh, stuff about Africa. And he concludes, he says that, um, so, you know, the notion of that the, we have here in the West is that we've been very generous to Africa in the post-independence era. And we've given all of this money to the Africans, and, and look what little it's got. They haven't managed to develop, they've done nothing. It's, it's just a waste, is the implication, right? Well, I want to um, uh, put that in a different context for you, which you felt when you're not here from the other speakers. 
and that is that the United States gave uh, at multi, but at, in total, meaning in, via two different ways, multilaterally, meaning through the United States contributions to multilateral institutions, EK, the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, etc. So that's the multilateral side, and then the bilateral side, and the direct assistance. The United States gave Africa, the entire continent of Africa, since 1945, meaning 70 years or so, a trillion dollars. Sounds like a lot until I tell you that I'm about to tell you. Right. Uh, right. The United States gave the single country of Japan between 1950 and 1970, $500 million a year on Shall I repeat that? The United States gave one country called Japan $500 million a year for 20 years. And you can go around other American relationships, whether it's the Marshall Plan, or whether it's South Korea, or whether it's Taiwan, or various other parts of the world, and do a challenge. And you will be forced to, you will be obliged to conclude that this much valued gener generosity immense assistance that is has supposedly been given, to, given by the United States to Africa is a myth. A trillion dollars said in isolation sounds like a lot of money, but that is only without context. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that the United States has a particular obligation to give any amount of money to any given country or country. But we cannot speak intelligently about what the United States has done for Africa, as I think other speakers are going to do without understanding what the United States has done in other parts of the world, and knowing, in consequence, relative to those other experiences, what to make of the, the relationship with Africa. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we, I kept you guys long. Okay. And, uh, Thank you. Um, so this is a question one hears a lot, and I don't begrudge you your question, and I'm going to try to answer it uh, as sincerely as I can, and hopefully satisfying me. But I don't think you heard me say that the United States or the Europeans need to give something to Africa. 99% uh, of what I said to you just now was, just, was simply an account of the history of the encounter between European civilization and Africa. Um, and I began my talk by saying that there is a lot of facile thinking about, you know, hand-wringing about, oh my, oh my, those poor Africans, can they ever do anything, can they ever amount to anything? Are they, is, you know, is there any point? Uh, and I said to you, and I haven't been able to develop this as much as I would have liked, but I could go on for another hour if you invite me back, that, um, uh, the, that Africa, my whole premise was that in fact, given this kind of background, Africa has done actually rather well. As a matter of fact, Africa today is growing in the aggregate faster than any other part of the world, faster than Asia. You have not heard, most of you will never have heard that. Africa is growing today, on average, as a continent, faster than any economic, than any other part. Um, so I do not believe that, it's that there's any um, sort of necessary obligation on the part of this, you know, there's no, I don't believe in some innate, inherent mission that the Europeans or the Americans have to take care of Africa. I do believe, however, in understanding history the way it is, and understanding the implication of this historical background for the current state of things in Africa. Uh, and that was the entire point that I was making. Oh, yeah. 
It's a very good question, and it's a very complicated topic, and I'm not sure that I can really satisfy you completely with my answer, but um, I, I, I would say that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the background of China and the background of Africa are totally different. Hong Kong, of course, historically, have always been China, it's part of China. China is, has had one more or less contiguous and coherent culture for a very long time, in fact, far longer than Europe. Um, and so the Europeans come and take control of Hong Kong, and their priority was not how do we obliterate the identity of these people? How do we um, how, how do we begin to invent new ethnicities and new tribes and new identities? How do we divide and subdivide these people? Um, the point of Europe and Hong Kong was, or Britain and Hong Kong was, how do we establish a toehold in a little man size-wise manageable place via which we can exploit economic operations throughout the rest of the vast thing that we call China. So this is a completely different process, a completely different uh, set of assumptions than uh, those which uh, go into Western behavior in Africa, which is what I, I've come up with, with you, which I've described to you already. Um, I, I would also say, just sort of like, I mentioned the social trust thing, which is something that I'm leading in our country. Recently, which I think is very important. This new line of interpretation of African history is going to take on subsequent more and more prominence. But the destruction of social trust via the slave trade in Africa um, contrasts very uh, interesting with the experience of East Asia in the post World War in the post World War. Um, certain African countries, Ghana being one of them, especially like Ghana. Previously, were richer than some very successful Asian countries are today. Ghana in 1945 had a per capita income higher than today, than South Korea did, higher than Taiwan did, higher than uh, you know various other parts of Asia today that are quite rich. How does the change of how does the turnabout of circumstances happen? Well, there are many pieces of that answer, and I don't pretend to. I am about to say that social trust is the only piece of the answer. But because China, because Hong Kong, did not have these sorts of divisions foisted on them, forced via yeah, slavery, via yeah, sort of anthropological mission that I described, the social institutions that existed in places like that remained intact. Uh, if you don't have social trust, I said you can't do business with other people. You can't have credit, you can't write a check, you can't have a deal that's based on handshake. You simply can't go very far in terms of your economic relationships with other people. Well, in Africa, that, in particularly in slavery intensive areas, this gets completely obliterated. In China, you don't have it. And so in China and other parts of East Asia, you have, in the post imperial, post colonial era, you have family groups, you have clans that remain intact. These become the most important motors of early post-colonial economic activity, where companies are family companies, or where clan companies, or trust across clans, people are dealing with each other on this basis. And this becomes the startup impetus for the East Asian economy. Um, and you can see it in South Korea today. The biggest companies in South Korea today are remain clan-based companies, Samsung, for example. A family company based on the front on the, on the back of a plan. Um, and so I think it doesn't explain everything, but I think social trust and social institutions and experience of slavery uh, have a very important role to play in the answer to the question. Thank you. you Thank you for spending your Friday with me. My pleasure. Hope you enjoyed it.